We turn then to the verses that are in verses 4 through 7 in Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 4 through 7. This is a remarkable chapter and you always have to keep in mind the first verse. A verse that often puzzles us. And that's why you have chapter 11. Because chapter 11 is an explanation of verse 1. Faith is the substance, that which makes it real and shows the reality of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What you're going to be going through with me for the next few weeks, God willing, is looking at examples of faith as substance, as something real. And this morning, by God's grace, we're going to consider that in Abel, Enoch and Noah, Three men of God who are used here as living examples. They bring us back to the importance of the word of God. Faith is not believing without reason. Faith is believing what God has said because God has said it and shown it down through history. We're going to look, by God's grace, at three examples. My sermon is titled, The Evidence of of faith and as we sit here this morning let's be sure that our faith is based on solid evidence not just flimsy fantasy or whim verse 6 is important without faith it is impossible to please him please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Not only is it important to see that faith has substance. It's important to see that you must have faith to please God. I'll explain it more by God's grace as we go through it. What I want to do as I've said is mention these three men. And I want to do that under these height titles. That faith works when it worships with Abel, when it walks with Enoch, and when it works with Noah. Those three words are important. Worship, walks, and works. That's the evidence of things not hoped for. Faith is therefore very practical. And you can evaluate a person's faith. Remember James says, faith without works is dead. It's not theory. It's not something you put in the cupboard and pull out on Sunday. It's a whole life experience and our whole lives, therefore, are designed to show forth God's grace and God's mercy. We look first then at Abel. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts and through it, he being dead, yet speaks. This first illustration and example is very important. Faith is a gift from God. And you know that you have it because it leads you to worship God. It leads you to the cross where you confess your sin. It leads you to the one who was hung upon the cross where you embrace him as your saviour. It leads you to spend your life focusing on this great and amazing truth that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. I hope you know that verse from Galatians 2.20 because it says that Paul's going to live his life by faith. In the Son of God that loved me and gave himself for me. I put it to you then that Abel is presented to us in Scripture to remind us that faith is first of all evident in that admitting I'm a sinner and drawing near to God through the sacrifice of Christ, having been forgiven and having been justified in the middle of the verse. He obtained witness that he was righteous. Therefore, being justified by faith, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, we have peace with God. Faith is at the very heart of our Christian 
existence. And can I just underline again, it's not anti-reason. It's not some power that you stir up. It is in fact the gift of God. By grace you are saved through faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8. And it makes it very clear and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. You know you have it then because you draw near to God in Christ. And put it back in the context of Hebrews. Remember these people are, are on the verge of going back to Judaism and abandoning what Jesus has done. And so the writer here brings Abel to their attention quite deliberately that they might understand that this has been the foundation, this has been the principle since the foundation of the world. One of my books was quite helpful when it said Adam and Eve didn't have to live by faith. They had seen God. Abel, as their oldest son, is the first man in history to need to live by faith. He heard the news from his parents and he saw how God dealt with his parents and he made it his life's practice and habit. And dear friend, so should you and I. I'm always intrigued by Romans chapter 1 when Paul is introducing himself to the church in Rome and he's saying he's going to visit. Now when you think about the apostle, you would imagine he might be going to lecture on some great um, insight of religion or something, but he says, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. It brings us to this great, awesome, life-affecting truth that Christians are always approaching God through the cross by God's grace we'll celebrate communion today that's how the church in modern times brings it to our attention and we are to do that regularly because truly faith first and foremost is about looking to God through Christ it's about recognizing that we are sinners who deserve judgment but that God has decreed there shall be mercy Abel would have seen it in his parents. They had sinned, they rebelled against God, they deserved judgment. Genesis chapter 3, God says to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's clearly a, a prediction of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and him dying on Calvary. Satan indeed bruised his heel. But in actual fact, Satan was crushed by Christ at Calvary. That was the great hope of the gospel given to Adam and Eve. But it was not all that God had done. Genesis 3.21 Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Where do you get a tunic of skin? You have to take it from a living animal. And when you do, that animal dies. It's normally understood that for Adam and Eve to be covered, an innocent creature had to die. And there you have the very first indication of the principle of what's called substitutionary atonement. Where the innocent takes the place of the guilty. And then all through the Old Testament, you have that pattern, don't you? Noah sacrifices when he comes out of the ark. Adam brings sacrifices, sorry, Abraham brings sacrifices. And at one point, is even willing to sacrifice his son. And then you come to Mount, the mountain where the law is given at Sinai. And from there, a whole system of sacrifices are appointed. Sacrifices which the book of Hebrews tell us were only a picture. The very repetition of which proved that they themselves did not affect what was needed. And so John the Baptist sees Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The one that it was pointing to became a reality. And in Christ... Salvation has been created. 
for anybody to leave Christianity and go back to religion is a disaster, an offense to the living God. Abel, by faith, offered to God a more excellent sacrifice. People get tangled up as to whether it was his sacrifice which was better. But in actual fact, the true sacrifice is the expression of faith. The word order in the Greek makes it very clear. I hope you know the account, how there were two brothers, Abel, another butterfly, Abel knew that there had to be sacrifices and he came by the way that was set before him by his parents. Cain brought some of the produce of the field, some of the firstborn of the field, some of the things he had made. And so what he did to God was he brought to God something to show off how good he was. Cain's sacrifice was rejected. Abel's was accepted. And that's what it's describing here as more excellent. The Lord was gracious even to Cain. Genesis 4 verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you will not do well, sin lies at the, at the door and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. You see, the Lord told Cain that his sacrifice was unacceptable. And that what he was looking for was a heart set on God. Rather than somebody showing off how good he was or how much he had actually accomplished. Let's be very clear that this is the dividing principle between religion and Christianity right down through the ages. I've used the illustration often and don't apologize for it. There are only two religions in the world, do and done. Religion says you must, you must, you must, you must. And it will make long lists and it's amazing how people follow them. In the Middle East, twice a day, everything stops and they look toward Mecca. And they think that by submitting, that's the meaning of Islam, isn't it? Submission. That somehow God will be impressed with them. They need to read what God said to Cain. They need to learn from the scriptures that the only way a man or woman can be accepted by God is if there is an innocent substitute to take away their sin. Not an animal substitute, but Christ. I read Isaiah 53 this morning, quite appropriate. Because it describes there how God laid on him the iniquity of us all. It describes for us in the Bible how the Lord Jesus set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. And even when Peter wanted to stop it, his words were, get behind me, Satan. There was one practice, one principle that God must fulfill. Abel looked forward to that and he obtained the witness that he was righteous, that he was acceptable to God, that he had been forgiven. And so he stands here at the, the top of the list of Old Testament saints to help you and me remember that this is the beginning, the middle and the end of our Christianity. Why, why do I have hope? Why do I look forward, we were singing in that hymn, to the inheritance which is reserved for me? Because God has made it clear that he accepted Jesus' sacrifice by raising him from the dead and accepting him back into glory. Dear friends, let's make sure that the evidence of our faith is known to ourselves and seen by all around us. Worship God through the innocent sacrifice. Draw near to God every day of your life, and I hope more than once a day, through the blood of Jesus. Enter into his courts with thanksgiving, because you've been washed 
in the blood of the Lamb. That's the first evidence that a man or a woman is a true believer. You ask them their hope and they're not going to tell you anything about who they are or what they've done. They're just going to talk about him and thank God for him. Make sure it's your life's practice. Again, verse 6 is very important. It applies to all examples. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. That doesn't leave much room for negotiation, does it? Impossible. And so we call men and women to faith in Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is not advice. It's a command from the Bible. And not to believe is to be like Cain. Sin lies at the door and will in fact devour you. Take control of it. Don't allow it to determine who you are and what you'll do. Say to God, I've read in your word, I've studied, I know it's a historically accurate book. I know that these things really did happen. And I'm going to rest in Jesus Christ. Christian, be encouraged if that's where you are today. Let it stir up in you a new sense of worship. Just say thank you to God where you're sitting now. It's the most significant, most important, most powerful thing in your whole wide life. And it's God's indictment against unbelievers. You see that word believe? It, it just hinges on it. Faith includes knowing, believing and trusting. And if you're able to do that, it's because of God's mercy and God's love toward you today. If you're refusing to do that, you're insulting your creator. You're calling him a liar. Faith then believes through Christ. It walks with Enoch. Enoch is an amazing character. His name only appears in a genealogy in the book of Genesis. Hardly noticed at all, but when the writer of Hebrews wants to stir these Christians up into living their Christian life, he says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He had this testimony. You see, Enoch was so much aware of God's love and grace. Every day of his life, he was in constant communion with him. He knew God so well and was known by God so well that God says, just come up here and join me. And I think that's a challenge to us as Christians. Because real faith shows not only in trusting Christ, but it shows in an ongoing, growing and developing relationship with God through Christ. Faith is the substance. This is the reality. Think about those Christians that have been a great help to you, by whom you've been blessed. They will have been people who, who, who seem to have a, a nearness to God that was almost unique. Dear friends, this passage tells me that that's to be my portion and my practice. And to look at Enoch and say, Lord, that's how you want me to be. And to realize the blessing of it. That even as Enoch was taken into God's presence, one day I will be. And I'll be there forever. So many people tell me when I talk to them in the marketplace that when they meet God, come in, is that we walk with God as Enoch walked with God. We live in his presence and we become so familiar with him that we are indeed ready and looking forward to the day when he takes us to be in his presence and to live there 
forevermore that faith is not a static thing it is a, a growing developing entity that believing in Jesus initially is the beginning of a lifelong experience where we get to know God better I love that phrase of the Apostle in Philippians where he talks about pressing on that I might know him and the power of his resurrection so the Christianity is not simply a philosophy it's not simply a religion it is in fact a relationship and it's seen most clearly here in the life of Enoch if you look at verse 5 it says by faith and notice that's first Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death because God had taken him for before he was taken he had this testimony that he pleased God he had this testimony it's interesting if later you have time to go back into the book of Genesis and you'll find that all around Enoch people are dying it is true that they live much longer than modern man lives but inevitably they are dying Enoch is unique one of only two characters in the whole Bible who go into God's presence without dying I feel I might put a test on you and ask you who the other one is but I'll not make you struggle the other one is Elijah he was caught up in a chariot wasn't he into God's presence so that Enoch you see is taken by God while the world around him is experiencing God's judgment on sin which is physical death and then eternal spiritual death and so Enoch has much to teach us do you notice here it says he was taken before he was taken he had this testimony that he pleased God and then verse 6 goes on to say without faith it's impossible to please God that phrase please God is a, a lovely description it tells us that God was so moved by this relationship with Enoch that he took him home it's very tempting to make a silly sort of illustration but maybe it would work you've gone to visit friends or relatives and they've got this lovely pet and it, it gives you such pleasure that you almost feel you could take it home with you that's a picture that's given to us here in the passage our need for a saviour is established and able and our need for a personal saviour one with whom we are familiar one who is as Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs the friend who sticks closer than a brother Proverbs 18 24 Enoch was taken from this world right into the presence of God Genesis 5 24 says Enoch walked with God and he was not for God to get the most incredible statement isn't it sometimes you want to stop and say excuse me God could we have more explanation we don't you have the word of God the living word of God and it's given to us to stimulate us to follow along that pattern and to, 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 to seek by God's grace to have that kind of life that God would want us in his presence immediately but leaves us here so that we can be a witness in the meantime I'm running ahead of myself that's Noah Enoch walked with God and that pleased God he was in fellowship with God that phrase walked with God is used throughout the early chapters of the Bible to describe that kind of fellowship in fact it says in chapter 6 and verse 9 of Genesis Noah walked with God it tells us he had that kind of relationship imagine many of you enjoy walking people come to this part of the world to go walking what's one of the joys and delights of walking it's having a companion with you you're suddenly away from all the other interesting things in the world and you do that in strange experience called talking and by talking you 
not only express what you think, you, you, you learn what makes the other person tick. And the more you get to know them, the deeper that relationship becomes and the more natural it is to be in their presence. This is a tremendous challenge to us as Christians. Do I have that kind of relationship with the God who gave his son to save me? I tell you now, it will be imperfect because you are still imperfect. For all you've been given faith in Christ and you have that saving relationship with God, you're still having to struggle with what the Bible calls the old man, the old woman. And it's like a dead weight at times. But can I ask you, do you have that kind of desire, that kind of outlook? Where you want to understand God's word. For you want to talk with the one who talks to you through it. That's what prayer is after all. It's not complicated. It's a challenge which comes to us all the way through the Bible. These are the words of the Lord Jesus. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Or Paul in Romans 12, in the light of all that he said, therefore present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Give yourself to God. Get to know him. It would be a horrible thing to end up in heaven and, and be faced with a stranger. The most beautiful part of being a Christian is that he loves me. He gave himself for me. And now the life that I live, I will live by, you know that little five-letter word, faith in the Son of God. Faith is the substance, it's the evidence, it's the, the visible thing that others can see and you can see for yourself. I do always have to be careful that I don't present it as an idea where you'll reach perfection because then it'll become a stick for your back. I only ask you, is it where you're aiming? Is it what you're looking for? If it is, then you're like Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And then notice this next phrase. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a, notice the next word, rewarder. There's a blessing waiting for you. The book of Hebrews is very clear. Under the Mosaic system, which the priests um, worked, the temple and the sacrifices, people could not come into God's presence. The nearest they could come was to hand over the animal for the sacrifice. Only the priests could operate in the holy place. And only the high priest in the holy of holies. The scriptures are clear. When Jesus died, the curtain was torn from top to bottom. God did it. And then the book of Hebrews is very clear. Twice it says that we are to come boldly into the presence of the living God. To come boldly. Why? Not to be visitors that we might find help and grace in our times of need. And so you see what the writer of Hebrews is doing here. He's making it very clear. That Christians are to be often in God's presence. You can't tie it down to 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at lunchtime, or 15 minutes at night. It's sometimes useful to have a structure like that, but you can't tie it down to that. The great desire of a Christian is to walk with God. Paul tells us, walk in the Spirit. It's a call, it's a command, it's a challenge. And Enoch is right here. The only way to survive in a wicked world, and remember Enoch was one individual in a wicked world. 
The only way to cope with the madness of an unbelieving generation is to keep close to God. So Christian, let's indeed make that our priority. That it might be our business in life to grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It might be our business in life to, to, to make it our business to be near to him. That's the dynamic of faith. That's how it goes on personally, day by day. It's much more than a philosophy. I've written down here, and I don't know whether I should say it or not. I'm engaged to Christ, and I'm soon to be married. I'm engaged to Christ. My wife tells me, was it yesterday or today, is the 50th anniversary of our engagement. It's amazing. Wives are very useful. They keep tab on these things, you see. So for a whole, it would only be six months, wasn't it, before we got married? For a whole six months, I knew what was coming in March 1970. The Christian is engaged. Christ loved us. We're his bride. One day we're going to be joined to him forever. If I had just forgotten about Carter those six months and turned up on the wedding day, she would have been quite entitled to say, who are you? But it had the reverse effect. You spend more time together. You get to understand each other better. You look forward with anticipation. That's the gospel. That's the Christian life. That's walking by faith. And God gives that kind of faith to everybody who wants it. And that's the challenge for anybody who's not a Christian. There's no excuse for not being a Christian. The gospel is as plain as plain could be so that a blind man running can understand it, it says in one of the prophets. So if you're not a Christian, the only person that's responsible is sitting in your seat. And I plead with you today to flee to Christ. He died as a substitute so that whosoever believes will be saved. Are you saved today? Come on now. If you're not, who's responsible? What's keeping you back? You are. And if you die in that state, there is no, there's nobody in heaven waiting to welcome you. There is, in fact, eternal separation. I read a little comment. Let me just check the time. It always runs away from me. I read a little comment yesterday which, which tried to explain the insult of unbelief. Imagine if you met somebody and they said to you, this is entirely fictitious, I'm Mrs. Jones. I live in Pickering and I've been here for 30 years. And you said to them, I don't believe you. That would immediately put the hackles up a little bit, wouldn't it? She then dips into her purse and pulls out her driving license, shows you the picture, shows you the address on the driving license and you say I don't believe you can you feel the tension that we'll be building that's what an unbeliever does every time they look in this book every time God speaks to them through the scripture they say to him I think you're telling me lies and that dear friend is the, 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 the damning indictment of sin so I plead with you again Confess to God your rebellion and flee to Christ. But let me go on and just finish in these last few minutes. Because faith not only worships with Abel, faith not only walks with Enoch, it works. I like that little phrase in the book of Galatians where it says faith works through love. You see, faith is a personal thing, but it actually is very public. Faith, says James, without works is dead. Let's see how Noah can help us. By faith, verse 7, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. 
It's interesting to notice, you see, that little phrase of things not seen. And go back to verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You worship God through Christ. You, you rest in the finished work of Christ. You, you walk with God like, like Enoch did. You're in a relationship so that if he should say, come up here now, you're ready to go. Bags are packed. I'll not be scrambling around to find something that I, I don't want to leave behind. And then finally, it shows in the world. And I couldn't help but thinking how, how relevant these examples are. We live in a day and an age when Christianity is scoffed at. It's the butt of the joke of most of modern comedians. My fellow Scotsman, Billy Conley, he tears the Bible to pieces. Or he thinks he does. It was Mary Whitehouse way back in the 19... got to show my age now, early 1970s, who highlighted the fact that, that the enemy has always used laughter to plant ideas and undermine faith. She went back to Lord Hawhaw during the war and he would scoff at the British Army and say it couldn't... It couldn't do anything useful. And she pointed out that the comedians were in fact Satan's tool to destroy people's confidence in Christ. And so when you offer them a gospel tract, what they say is, no, I'm all right. Let's be very clear. God calls us to live in a world like that. And we're not the first people to have to do it. Noah had to let his light shine before men. He had to be a light to this world. And he was given grace and he, be, he was that light because of what God had done in his life. An amazing man. He believes God and he's righteous because of it. He builds an ark. And let's, let's understand, there was, there was no previous example of, of ships of such size. Well, ship's a bad word, isn't it? It's technically a great big box. If you want to see what it was like, is it Ken Ham in America? They've actually built a, a life-size model. And it's like a theme park you can go to. I don't know if I'd want to, but that's, that's what they've done. So you can see the size of it. It's enormous. And it took them 120 years to build it. Can you imagine the conversation with his neighbours? What are you doing today? Noah, I'm building an ark. There's a judgement coming. The world's going to be flooded. What? And as it goes up, are you still building that Noah? There's been no rain here for years. And you're going to need a boat as big as that. But to God's glory, Abraham, Noah's faith showed the reality of things hoped for. The reality of things not yet seen. And that is faith. Not pie in the sky when you die. I love the opposite. Cake on the plate while you wait. We have the reality of a living saviour. We have the reality of a living relationship with God. We have been declared righteous because of what Christ has done. Somebody writes, I think it's D.L. Moody. We are far more privileged than these people were. They were looking forward and had nothing really to, to hold on to except God's word. We can look back and we can see all this history made real. And therefore what we are enabled to do is to take God at his word and to trust him. And that, dear friend, is life's great, great challenge. Not only to say I believe the Bible, but to live the Bible. To be in this world what God has called us to be. Because we know that judgment's coming. And that there is only one place of escape. That ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. When the judgment comes, only those who are in the ark are saved. When the final judgment comes, only those who are in Christ are saved. 
And therefore the exhortation of the scripture is to be in Christ. But I'm going back. Let me go forward. I want you to think long and hard. One man in a wicked world. And because he knows God, you have to assume that he also offered sacrifices. He also walked with God. We know that when Noah comes out of the ark, he offers sacrifices. It would have been the, the practice but you see, he was believing God for things which nobody else had seen. Things which had not yet become a reality. And it says here, he was moved by godly fear. That's reverence. That's awe. That's worship. That's the essence of the power to live a Christian life. You see, I know what it's like as a young Christian to be afraid to tell anybody you believe in the Lord Jesus. That's the fear of man. And it will come back and go down throughout life. The only way to overcome the fear of man is to recognize is that God is awesome beyond description. Able to save to the uttermost, but ultimately the judge of every man. And when you get him in focus, everything else falls into place. And that's the challenge of the life of Noah. Genesis 6, 22. Thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. Genesis 7, 5. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. I'm not aware of anybody here having been given instructions to build a great big ship. But I'm very much aware that all of us have been given instructions to live holy, godly, righteous lives. To live lives which actually have the effect of making the unbeliever saying, what, what, what's making you different? Second Peter, isn't it? We have to be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within us. It should be that obvious that you don't have to push it to people. They can see that you march to a different drummer. That you're out of step with the world. That your goals and ambitions are not simply to succeed, to become rich. To become famous, to become important. But that your goals and ambitions are to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Imagine 120 years, you get little insights. First Peter chapter 3 verse 20. He talks about the world they were living in and he says, Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Why does God allow so much evil in the world? Divine long-suffering. If God stopped all evil, every individual would stop breathing. And judgment day would be upon us. God puts up with what he hates, so that men and women can encounter Christians who are living in the ark of Christ, and looking for that great day. Peter says again, 2 Peter 2.5, that God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, and listen to this phrase, a preacher of righteousness. Noah not only built an ark, he told people why he was building it. And that's quite simply what we're doing as a church. So many folks want to measure Christian churches by numbers. It's not about numbers. You can have a place packed full. Kath and I went on holiday a couple of weeks ago and had to search for a place to worship. We found what we thought would be a place to worship. I never heard the gospel. I heard about being a good person. I heard about trusting God for what he'll do in your life. But never once a call to repentance. That's the world you and I live in. So the real test of a church is not numbers. The real test of the church is, is the gospel preached there. 
The real test of a Christian is, is my life a gospel life? So that my light is shining before men and I'm salt to the world. Now I do warn you, it's not easy. Laughing is the least that they will do to you. But we've been left here like Noah was left. Enoch was taken, Noah was left. We've been left here for that purpose. Paul writes to Timothy, however, for this reason I obtained mercy. Yes, Paul, why did you get mercy? That in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering. That's very true, Paul, but why? As a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. God says, your light is what he's going to use to bring other people to Christ. Do you believe that? That the people who are most likely, humanly speaking, to become Christians are already in your center of in cent circle of influence and in mine. Now you can't make Christians, that's God's business. We have to be witnesses. By our choices, by our words, by our practices, building an ark. And so real faith works like Noah does. I'm running out of time, I need to just press on. And that's what I'm challenged with from this book. It would be so easy in these damn, damning days just to throw in the towel and say nobody's interested. I was speaking to a local vicar here, Rob Barker, some of you know him. And I was making that statement that nobody's really interested now. He says, actually they are. He says, I sometimes go into a local pub in the night and he says, sometimes I can't get out until after closing time. People have just got so many questions. We need to find ways to be available to answer them. And you don't have to have perfect answers. What you do need is to be ready to point them to Christ. Can I just come back then and say to any unbelievers who listen to this online or hear, that if you're not a Christian, it's a disastrous tragedy. It's not just, oh well. It is a, a life-threatening condition. My brother-in-law has been diagnosed with cancer, and thank God for the doctors. They're doing their best to, to heal him. But as soon as you hear the C word, everybody's ears prick up, don't they? Don't want that. I wish I could get unbelievers' ears to prick up like that. When I say the J word, not Jesus, but judgment. My Bible is very clear. God has already shown us all the evidence we're going to get by raising Jesus from the dead. Acts chapter 17. And now commands all men everywhere to do what? Change how they think. Have their heart changed and change direction. That's pretty all encompassing. The Bible uses a little six letter word called repent. And so to every unbeliever I say today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Repent, believe. You've no guarantee of tomorrow. And look at this fabulous gospel. Who wouldn't want it when you understand what God has provided? Not only life here and everything we need for it, but worlds to come. I need to wind up. Don't C.S. Lewis book, Predator Land Run. Read it. He has this theory in the book which has bugged me since I read it. That the reason that only the earth has inhabitants is because through Satan's fall, God shut off the rest of the universe. And that when the world, the new heavens and the new earth come, then we will indeed be able to go where no man has ever gone. For the whole expanse is created for God's people. Are you going there? Or are you going to that other place? 
Her final hymn is How Firm a Foundation, You Saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his word. What a missed out word. But that's the essence, the call to live by faith. I've just seen you, Thomas Langton, who preached around these moors, didn't he? He was a farrier during the week, and he preached at the weekend, but his preaching was becoming so demanding he didn't have time to do his business to live by. He was walking over the moors back to the village of Kitwick, and he was truly considering just living by faith. Could he trust God? Could he walk with God? He had old parents, aged parents to look after and nobody else to provide for them. He had responsibilities. Could he trust God? And as he prayed, he became aware of Psalm 37. And it was in that psalm that he met God through his word and he was persuaded he should. A few days, well, a few weeks later, walking over the same moors, Satan whispered in his ears, Well, where's your faith now, Mr. Langton? You've been preaching for over eight weeks and you don't have a penny to take back to your parents. And it would appear from the book that he's tormented by these thoughts and he's walking past the farm. It says in the book where, is it 12 out of 15 children had been converted through his ministry. A Mr. Moore. Thomas, says Mr. Moore. How are you getting on? How are you surviving? How are you providing for your family? Thomas says, I don't... Uh, God provides. He says, by the way, Thomas, here is a sovereign I have for you. And by the way, Mrs. Moore says she's got one for you. So as he walks on rejoicing, God's providing, he's living by faith, he meets a Mr. Attlee. And Mr. Attlee says, ah, Thomas, we were just talking about you in bed last night. Here's a sovereign for you. And Mrs. Attlee, she has another. And Thomas Langton went on then to work around these areas for many, many years by faith, trusting God, believing that he will indeed give us our daily bread and bring us to glory. The whole challenge of this chapter, and we've only just dipped our toe in it this morning, is going to be about trusting God so that it can be seen and lived and known. May God, by his grace, encourage you to step out in faith every day. I need to start every morning and finish at the end of the day by saying thank you. Amen.